The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Glasgow Section PWI meeting for February 2021. Welcome to, to all, and thanks for turning up tonight. Uh, hopefully you can see the agenda, and I'll just run through the items that you can see on the agenda. A little uh, reminder of domestic arrangements. The meeting will be recorded. It's not being recorded at this moment in time, but it will be recorded. Cameras will be off. Uh, audience will be muted during the presentation, but later on, we'll unmute the people that want to actually say their piece. In the meantime, please raise any questions or make comments via the dashboard questions pop up, and hopefully you can see that. And the bit that says questions, if you click on that, you can undock it or you can open it, and you can ask questions as you watch the presentation. And we'll discuss these in turn after the main presentation. Some six news uh, and apologies, first of all. Do we have any apologies, Jim, for tonight's meeting? I, there are no apologies intimated, Tom. Okay, thanks for that. And just a reminder that our section meeting is going forward as before. Third Wednesday of the month, we are not tied to the PWI's go-to webinar offer, offering. This is, this is a separate thing, so we can get to choose our meeting days. And we've stuck to the third Wednesday of each month, so occasionally we clash with others in the PWI. These will continue as webinars until current restrictions are lifted, and there's been a sniff of that, but I'll, I'll let that develop. And when we do return to face-to-face -to -face meetings, these will be held in uh, WSP's Queen Street Conference Room and also recorded as webinars for those that can't make it on the night. Uh, the face-to-face -face is preferred because the camera here and the, the free drink is provided, so people are welcome to come in and have a beer, have a chat, meet the presenter afterwards, all that good stuff. In the meantime, you have to make to do with this electronic version. So uh, our next meeting, will be our AGM, so that's on the 17th of March. And prior to the webinar on that night, we're going to have the AGM. The AGM agenda is the apologies. I'll say a few remarks, and then we'll talk about the, the minutes of the previous AGM. And then we have the appointment of section officials and committee members for the 21-22 season and any other business. And just a little note that Greg McMillan has agreed to be nominated as chairman, <coughs> excuse me, and Angus MacDonald has agreed to be nominated as Section Secretary. Uh, anybody else that wants to put their name forward for either of those two positions or to come along and join the committee, please feel free to make us alone on the 17th and we'll do your best, our best to accommodate you in the team. OK, uh, moving on to tonight's speaker. Tonight we've got Paul Coyne. Senior Project Engineer from Babcock Rail Systems Alliance Brackets, Scotland, close brackets. Paul's career in rail began in 2004 as a modern apprentice with First Engineering, uh, the old First Engineering. But he earned an honest living, he says, as he acquired the core skills in track engineering and moved to a post as a time served, I'll call it, project engineer. So from apprentice to fully fledged project engineer. Staying the course at First Engineering as they became Babcock Rail in 2007, Paul continued to excel in the career in track renewals. Uh, working in plane line and SNC renewal contracts allowed him to develop skills in planning and logistics and to refine his technical expertise in track excavation and track reinstatement. In 2014, a move to Amy and a promotion to senior project engineer saw Paul's technical career continue in the Amy Sersa SNC North Alliance. In delivering that contract, Paul's competence in CWR stressing at level three, handback engineering at level four, were complemented by his continuing experience in design setting out and tamping, including the preparation of tamper machine geometry files and the on site trimble dozer control files. Paul currently works with Babcock on the Rail Systems Alliance in Scotland, delivering Network Rail's track and systems work. And his paper tonight is called Modern Track Geometry Installation. Now, I just have to transfer the presentership to Paul, so allow me a moment to do that.
and Paul's screen will be shared in a moment or two. Okay, and hopefully you can all see that. I can see it. So, Paul, over to you. Hi, how are you doing? Can you, can you hear us okay? Yep, loud and clear. Right, okay, well, um, I'll get started. Um, as you just said there, my name's Paul Coyne. Um, I've worked in a few places now for First Engineering, Babcock, Amy Sersa, and then back to Babcock, just following the, the 2 P process over the last few years. Um, and now, <clears throat> now working with the Rail Systems Alliance, uh, predominantly SNC renewals, but um, having a wee data panned in and putting line here and there when it's uh, needing some help. So <clears throat> uh, I, I asked to do a paper on some tra modern track geometry installation by Greg. Um, he's obviously seen some of the kit we've been using since he's joined the Alliance uh, with Arcadis. So I've put something together. I'm going to try and make it now sound like I'm a salesman for Trimbo, but uh, Trimbo um, is a big part of the kit that we're using. So I'll just go through how, how we used to work and uh, what we're kind of doing now and uh, what the difference in technologies are, which is ease of life for us as engineers out on track. So the, the first slide I've got here is obviously, um, some of you will know a lot better than me. Um, I've only done a little of this during my apprenticeship working with the design team. And it's uh, the, the hard survey. Um, obviously, the hard involved mills on offset, a string out, outside the curve, um, used the, the, the offset ruler. Um, this hard survey method, obviously, is principles to measure the vertical lines along an existing curve. Based on the Versine values, the radius of the circle curve could then be measured. Um, and then for that measurement, the Versines get took back in to the office. And there was a lot of uh, complex calculations and moving things back and forward in Excel to, uh, to get a smooth curve. Um, so by, by, caring, by, by comparing the surveyed Versines figures to design Versines, this can be used to determine what slews would apply to the track in order for it to be correctly aligned. This was often done using pegs, uh, which were driven into the ground in the cess beside the track, to, and then for there we aligned using tapes. And uh, that was one of the processes that we called setting out. So if you see the picture there, we've got the, the hard handles and the fishing gut, and most of you will remember this, that it nearly took your fingers off as you try to pull it tight uh, on some of the cold nights. So I see some pictures I dug back into the archives um, and found some of these renewals that we done up north by applying these principles um, of installing wooden pegs. So you can see here that we've got the wooden pegs down the side of the track and then on the, the, the plain line one here, the straight, we've got the, the pegs on the side of the track. So these pegs were driven into the, the ground 10 metre intervals existing peg height and offset, the, the rail, the closest rail was measured. We then applied the design lift and slew, which was from the designer. And then we marked up some new proposed heights and offsets on the peg, so that once we ripped the track out, we could come back and install the track back in its new design position. Everybody knows that these pegs were reliable for the first 15 minutes you put them in the ground, because people like to put panels on top of them, sit on top of them, put the hang their jackets on them, hang their hard hats on them, put lighting bogies against them, every single thing that you're only meant to do, these pegs are attracted. So some of the issues, it was time and the cost to install. Took a couple of weeks, some of these jobs were 10,000 yards long, you were going up um, weeks at a time, hammering in pegs. The reliability of them due to being hit and damaged, as we just discussed there a second ago. And after the track was removed, there was no way to then work backwards to work out if he'd made a mistake because you needed the existing track to be there. So the image on the right hand side obviously is during installation and it, the pegs looked to have done, done the trick. Um, they looked a nice shape. The image to the left hand side, as you can see, some of the pegs on the right hand side they are damaged, they're lying over. 
and then when we're, we're doing the tamping, you can see where the pegs in, it's nice and straight, and then when the damaged pegs are out, we've got an alignment issue, and then the issue is trying to work out where what the alignment movement should be, so at the end up, because the pegs damaged, the only way to get this back into uh, any shape was by doing it by eye and try to align it using the geometry. So a lot of it, we'll use the, the term lightly, but a lot of it was guesswork at the, at the end. Um, and some of the shaping was d down the eye because your datum had been destroyed using pegs. Bottom bars, dozing, um, techs that are listening, that been on site. How many fights you had with those or driver operators um, because of the quality of using 2D lasers? I mean, they do work. Uh, dual grade laser uh, with a vertical slope percentage. We did try a few times putting the dual grade in so we could try and keep the cross level on the the, the blade. It didn't work. Uh, the ballast design can't be manually set by the operator, offsetting the mass tights. So the, the biggest issue we had when we were working on high canty track was the blade doesn't stay at the same the same angle to cut the high side and the low side during dozing. So a lot of this time it was done to the skill of the operator um, to so that when he done his, his cut at the high side and then over the low side that we didn't have any wind rows left in the track. Um, and I remember once we were working on a job in the northeast, um, 150 mile can't. The operator got that pissed off that he actually punched and cracked the window of the dozer because he couldn't get it right. So we had so much frustration by lifting lone mass, the time it took to doze and get it perfect. Can't transitions was a conversation between ourselves and the dozer operator saying every time you see a peg, you need to lower. Um, your mass 10 mil to try and put a cant transition in, and then it was even worse if you're working in the West Highlands and you had direct reverses or the East Coast mainline direct reverses to so try to get these cant transitions using the, the dozer it was an absolute nightmare, which led to poor top and cant, which led to a lot of twist faults. For that, we had a lot of time jacking and packing, um, a lot of time spent putting ballast in the guys, can go packing at the time, try to take twist folks out before we could run over any auto ballasters or even get the tamp in. And then due to this track condition, half of the time we spent the first run of the tamper putting a bit of shape on the, the track before we could even make up a full proper 1ALC scheme to try and get it to track construction standards. So 2D laser dozing was good at the time. But an absolute nightmare. So things moved on, make it modern technology. So modern technology, what is it? We have digital surveys now, everything's done for the, it's been the last few years. Uh, the technology even has got better and better and better. I know it's been around for a while. So we've got total station surveys, and now we're also doing surveys using the GEDO trolley. The digital designs are no longer done in Excel. We have digital setting out. I don't use eggs anymore. Uh, everything's done with the, the digital strings, the, the theoretical center lines. You get 3D machine control using UTS, which is a total station and a prism. You get 3D machine control, which is GPS using a mushroom that's attached to the dozer. And the image to the right hand side, there's the, one of the jobs we've done 10 weeks ago at Dramalan. Um, nice open skies and the the line between uh, Stirling and Perth, and we set the GPS um, base station and to send out the corrections on top of one of the, the lock boxes. And then we also have the GEDO trolley for surveying, for asphalt and for pre tamping which helps us create uh, dozer files. And we also have GEDO that does scanning as well, which is a presentation on itself that, um, that you should maybe look into. So, 3D machine control. So, machine control involves integration of survey positioning equipment on earth work moving machines. So, if you look at the, the image here, if you look closely at the back of the digger, this was a renewal we've done at Moss End West, um, double junction. 
was the first time that we had used um, a bug with GPS capabilities. So you'll see the back there, it's got the two Trimble uh, GPS masks, and we also have the, the dozer with a single uh, GPS uh, system on the centre mast. So it can be fitted just about any Earthworks moving machines, typically larger dozers, excavators, you get graders and all that kind of stuff. That's the Trimble salesman part. And the survey position of the part, it breaks down into 3D, GPS, total station, or 2D if you're in a bit of trouble to guide the machine. For GPS systems, GPS receivers are mounted on the machine, which in conjunction with a GPS base station, which I showed in the previous picture, tells the system its position accurately. The 3D model is loaded onto the system, so the machine knows where it is, and it can then require its achieved design. The 3D total station setup works on the same principles. The total station set up is coordinated by shooting control points at either side of the track that's installed at the design phase. The total station is then pointed at the dozer, and the design that's built in Trimble Business Center is then fired into the dozer, and the dozer knows its position, which involves its change, its horizontal position, its vertical position, and its can't. So, all these systems work off of designs. So how do we get the designs from the design team, the original, and how do we get it in the, the earth moving machines? So what the operator sees inside the cab. So this is the, the pictures I took inside the, the machines at Mossy and West. So as you can see here, it's a Trimble CB460 box. That's, a, the, that's a brain that's inside the machines. So on the left hand side there you can see the excavator, the image of the excavator. So he can then see he's cutting the fill, so he knows when he's he's, he's digging out um, how much ballast or how much spoil he has away from the design position, so that when the dozer can on to do his final cut, he should only be trimming 10, 15 mil off of the cut, which then obviously speeds up uh, the rate of excavation or installation of the ballast. So the dozer on the right hand side, the dozer has an auto function. So if you look at the, the bottom left hand side of the screen, it says an auto, which then means you don't want to take away the skill for dozer drivers, but the driver then is only driving the dozer back and forward. So every time he presses that auto button, you'll see the cut, le cut left and cut right screens is over there. There's one's at zero, another one's sitting at one millimeter from design, which is good for obviously dozing. Uh, ballast or spoil, and the dozer driver can see in there he's got his, his change in his northern, so he knows exactly where he is along the track. You've got your design centre line, which is the blue line up the middle, which is your theoretical centre line between the two running rails, and then it shows him where his excavation uh, white lines are at the side, which is uh, the grey line. So he sees dozing along. Especially when you come into places where you've got SNC turnouts, where when it starts to go off into the shape of a triangle, he can see this kind of shape and he can follow that to make sure that we're cutting wide enough to let us install the geotextiles and obviously wide enough for our sleepers. There's other functions you can put into these boxes. Um, like if there's any hazards, if there's like a, a culvert underneath, which is not, not that deep uh, underneath the track, you can put a hazard warning in here, so when the dozer driver comes along, he gets a warning on his screen to let him know that there's a hazard to which he can see to eye, so he can take his time. So that's the computer that's inside the machines, and that's what the dozer or the digger operator in this case can see as he's uh, put driving along the track. So the designs, so the quality, the quality here, this is the, the Dramalan job. This is done in GPS, and as you can see there, that looks like a track that's been tamped. Um, and then here, obviously, this is pre-tamped. So this is just been dozed, relayed, real installed, and clipped up. And this is a direct reverse. And as you can see there for that, the shape. Um, we surveyed this this direct reverse using the, the survey tool and the, the GDO. The biggest differentiation, if you can, was six millimeters all the way through a direct reverse, which is absolutely incredible uh, for quality. 
This is Moss End West, double junction. Uh, the other picture was from using the GPS for the diggers. As you can see there, there's not a peg in sight. Um, every single bit of this junction was installed using uh, the total station. No pegs, no nails, no bits of string. Everything was done digitally. And um, same with the ballast. And you can see obviously the quality of the relay, again, pre-tamp. This is Cadder. Um, at the Christmas blockade that we just passed over there again, we renewed 12 uh, SNC units and there's no peg in sight, there's no fixed datums, everything's done digitally. Again, you can see the, the dozer on the right hand side this time using the UTS function and the total station just to the other side of the blade. Um, again, the quality installed by using 3D machine control, it makes the life of a track engineer a hard life to a good life. Um, so some of the pictures of the quality that we get. This one here was something we tried out <clears throat> using uh, the machine control. Um, we've done a bit something that's never really been done before. Uh, during the installation of the play line panels at CADA, we decided to use the magnetic rail foot here in the image on the left. We uh, put the multi-track target, which the total station sights onto. Uh, we attach it to the panel um, as uh, the key off, the two key rods there tandem lifted the panel off the wagon. We then gave the the Trimble handheld logger there, you know, which is in radio contact with the total station, so that the operator could see because one end of this panel butts up to plane line 56, which you can see in the ground. So the two rails obviously match up, the plates go on, and then the other operator then is used to getting told slew out, slew in by me or the other team using a tape, checking six foot ties that had been marked up using the total station and then feeding that back to the the crane controller. The crane controller then speaking through the radio to the operator, turn it move, turn left and turn right and so on. So what we decided to do was, is we gave him a visual aid. We put the logger inside his, his cab here as he was uh, installing the panel. And as you can see, once that panel was installed, the fill was 11 mil. So the track was installed 10 mil from the bottom ballast design. It was dosed to 10 mil. And then the offset here, you'll see 719. 719, we class as 717 is half the gauge, uh, roughly to put the track in place. So the offset for the multi-track target should be 717. So the operator, Dropped this panel in using a tandem lift, ten mil from design and bottom bars and two mil from two mil from line. So that was something new that we tried, and we we, we gave it a few goes through, and it, it seemed to be a success. So it's something we're going to continue out in the future. So we'll move on. So 3D machine control designs. Um, you could talk about Trimble Business Center again. Trimble, Trimble, Trimble all day, there's so many functions involved in this. So I just took a quick screenshot uh, of one of the designs that I've done recently. So the 3D models are created. So it all starts off with an XML file, which is country Bentley Rail, for the designers imported. A design corridor is created using the construction deck for material sizes. So it's a rail sleeper type, all that kind of stuff, the dig width, the, as a sand involved, the cross fall, Bottle bar design can and all that kind of good stuff. So, if you look at the image in the, the right hand side, you have the proposed centre line at the top, and then I just stick in the two rails to give me a guide how how far out um, we need to create our excavation. And then you have number four, which is BCL, which is our bar centre line. So from that, we build a model to go left and right. Of that there. So at this at this point you can see the cant. So if you look at the middle, the middle line, that's the shape the blade would be at this point. So as the dozer's coming along, that's the shape that the blade will be. That'll be the angle the blade's at, because you've put that in the design. And if you change on the formation file, you get FCL, FL, and FR. That's the formation crossfall. And you'll see that that's the shape the dozer would be as well. So the, the operator doesn't manually put the blade to an angle. It's done for this design. So this, this is a snapshot straight from Trimble Business Centre. So if I was to show you this live, 
and uh, was to move the cursor up and down, you would see the white lines for the ballast move left and right if you're going on a reverse. Like, so you could picture that the dozer, the dozer blade moving left and right if he's going on a left-hander or a right-hander. And that's how we build the fills up. But again, that itself, to go through that in great detail, would be another presentation on its own. So the machine control files are created in Trimble Business Centre and they're exported out into the field, installed into the screens that the, the, the operators can see they showed you earlier. Once we hook up to the Trimble um, talk station or the GPS system, and then we're good to go for dozing. So times moved on. Um, we used to use a two meter spirit level for checking the height difference between the two tracks. We then used five point lasers, or we still do use five point lasers, checking the, check the height between two tracks or your data in between pegs. We also use tapes to check our six foot ties. We use stuff like this to check the can. So somebody very clever came up with the Guido IMS system. And if you think about space, this is what this system is going to be like. So the Trimble Guido IMS system. So it's a track survey trolley uh, with a high precise IMU, which is a, an airshow uh, measurement unit. And it's also the basis run the efficient track survey and asset data collection. <clears throat> Trimble GDO is a suit of tools of measurement, recording and analysis for applications around railway track survey, construction and maintenance, especially tailored for railway tracks. Uh, the process is Trimble GDO streamlines all the work in the field in the office. The system uses standard techniques and data formats to share information, lead applications for railway track design and maintenance. So it's a simple self contained trolley that captures track position, gauge, can in a single operation. So what that's basically saying is you set the trolley up, we put it in its position and when you push it through, it measures track gauge, can position left and right. So it's horizontal and it's vertical position uh, to the said design. So the design gets loaded into this. So the IMU itself is based on high precision gyros and accelerometers. It's got a 600 hertz box, so the high speed data acquisition and sample rate takes 600 measurements a second. And it's got an embedded computer integrated. And the setup time, it says your six minutes, is actually five minutes. Um, when you set it up, it does an initialization project for five minutes and it counts down well it measures loads of different things so starting from the gravitational pull of the earth the air pressure um all, all these kind of stuff so uh, the part of the problem here the, the sensor technology so it's got three gyros for rotational movement and three accelerometers for linear movement and then there's a fancy formula there that I could not tell you what it means, but I know it's very, very clever. So how it works. So it comes in a couple of parts. So if I go back to slides, I'm going to point out, so you've got the Trimble trolley itself, which is a trolley. On the left-hand side, we've got the, the yellow box, which is a Guido IMU. We then have the data collection, which is the, the handheld computer. And then we have the profiler, which we're going to speak about, which is a laser pointer. We also have the total station and the Guido scanner and a GNS attachment. So the the the, the method we use is to measure a profiler, which is the same idea as the laser on a Mephisto. So using the profiler, the workflow for line measurement is identical to a coordinate mode. So what flow with a profile allows the user to define and measure chord start and end points by a profile measurement to reference points along the track. During the chord measurement, additional new topographic points and reference points can adjacent to the track can be measured using the profiler. So what this means is, is if you look in the left hand side here, you see the trolley at the start position. You set it up with one of your control points and you shoot that control point. As you push through, the track, you can stop. For instance, what we do is for tapping reference points, we shoot each date and play or 
target or spigot on each of the masts using the topple function. When you then push the track on, you, you could do as many many intermediate points as you like. And when you get to your second control point and you shoot that, and you end the survey, it then um, traverses all the new the topple points that you shot on the way through. So a traversing system, which usually takes a lot of time setting up legs, back sights, and all this kind of stuff, can be done in one easy push through with a trolley. You push it from point A to point B, shooting as many points as you like in between. And when you get to point B and finish the survey, it traverses all the, the points in between for you. So the, the, the field application, this is what we see when we do on the track. So we'll talk about the accuracy here. The Guido IMS uh, relative accuracy is less than a millimetre. And when you use it using the profiler, we're at a millimetre. And then as we start doing 65 metre cords, we try and go for 50 metre cords for tamping. So we're running about plus or one, maybe two millimetres um, in tolerance. And if you've got a damaged point and you start to go over about 130 metres, you're going to be working to about plus or minus three millimetres, which is very accurate considering um, the way it's set up. So what you can see in here is one of the screens. It tells you the change that you've just surveyed. It's lateral position, delta lateral, delta height, and delta can't. So these are all final positions from design. So the trolley is pushed through. Each reference point is shot using the profiler. And as you push through the data from each of these cords, is um, is logged on to the logged on to the, the handheld computer. So I've done some videos here. Um, I had to jump computers uh, last minute to try and log on. So the videos now seems to be playing its left hand side. I'm blaming Babcock Security for making me jump computers. But if I'm going to play this video, um, and I know I can see Tom McCallum's and he'll be able to hear this. That sound of the triple X going in the background for the weekend. I'll we'll hit this video, and this video is going to show us um, part of my poor Steven Spielberg camera controls. I'm trying to push a trolley and video at the same time. It'll give you a kind of insight what it looks like as we're pushing through. So the black dots that you can see in the right hand side of the screen are the control points. The dotted line from left to right across the screen is the position of the trolley. So as you push forward, you know when the, the dotted line's lined up with a black point, you align the control point. The changes at the top, the tangent points here, so the, the diamonds you can see on the center line plus the squares is all like your intersection points to your vertical curves. So it's got, it'll tell you about your spirals and all your, your different stuff to do with tran can transitions and where they all are on the track. The cord length is how far you've pushed the trolley from your control point before you get to your next control point. And as you'll see, they've got 69 meters. So we try and keep running about between 50 and 100 meters to try and keep the accuracy. It tells you the gauge down to a point a mil. So we just installed send 60, so it's 0.4 a mil out. So we've got 1438. And we've got the can't. And then also there we've got your twist. So as we push through, it measures the twist. And the functions at the bottom there, you can see the topple function that you can use to install additional control points and the track function here that you can see is also clever. If you have a set of clamp joints, you can put the trolley over the set of clamp joints and press the track position. It will then record that track position by a change and give a coordinate value to each of uh, the joints, which can then be logged digitally away for, for reference for later on. So I'll press the video and then hopefully um, it works. If, if it doesn't work in one, you let me know who can speak. So if that's the end of the video there. If you see the green bar, if you tilt your head to the side now, um, you can see the green bar is a speedometer. So the optimum speed is the two middle arrows in the middle of the, the speed bar there. So when you're walking around, you can measure around about two meters a second. 
taking all the, the information in. And as you see, the dotted line is now joined up with the black dot. And underneath the centre line, then it tells you that you have uh, a control point, which is the, the mast, uh, Lima Alpha 1122. And it tells you with a triangle arrow there that it's to your right-hand side, so that there's a need to help you find your control points. So I've done a second video here. So once we get to the end um, of a chord, we line up with the control point that's there. We line up the profile to the centre of the target, and we press the button. And, and this is where the magic happens. From pushing point, shooting at the target point A, pushing to target point B, the IMU, which is yellow box, is measuring. 600 measurements a second, all the way along that track, working out its lateral position, its vertical position, and its can't. So as we push along, we get to the end, we hit the finish button, and then if you watch slowly at the bottom of the screen, when we hit finish, it starts to merge data. So we hit measure. So if I pause here at this point, if you, again, turn your head to the side, it tells us at this point, the lateral position is 4.4 millimetres for design. The height is 14.6 millimetres from design. So I know when we used to say a minus, we used to always panic because it was higher design because you had to go minus. But in this case, it's from zero. So it's minus 14 from zero and zero is the target. So it's got a 14.6 millimetre lift. And the delta can't on this curve is out by 0 0.7 millimetres, so the can is obviously bang on as well. Where it says, please uh, measure a reference point, if you look at this part as I hit play, you'll start to see the, the computer system talking to itself, downloading data and merging data. It happens quite quick. So I've paused again. So what you can see here is it tells you you're measured 77.5 metres. The accuracy of the scaling is within, so you get a green tick, so it's just 0.15% out. So that means that when you're pushing along, the, the system knows between point A and point B is a certain length using its coordinates. So if you have any wheel slip, if it's icy or anything like that, you'll get an error message there to say that you had wheel slip and it would, uh, it would harm your accuracy. You tell you the average speed, that is because I was trying to follow them. As we were walking, we get just under half a metre a second, and the maximum speed was a metre a second. So at normal speed, we would measure two or three uh, metres per second, which allows us to stay right up uh, 10 metres off the triple X, which is impressive. If you wanted to do that survey in old school, you would need uh, six bodies. So I'll continue to play. So now, now that we've merged it, it tells you here between point A and point B, now that every five metres along the track, the lateral height and the delta can't. So as you, again, tilt your head to the side. You can see every five metres along the track, we've got roughly four millimetres slew and just around about 18 or 19 millimetres uh, for lift, so and the can again, the marks in the can is out there is 1.1 millimeter, which is impressive, but it's for its measurement. So you can see there that the track quality is looking good because the steps uh, between each of these measure points. We can then see it in a graph view, which is uh, handy to see a long stretch of um, information very quickly. The black line up the middle is the centre line, so you can see there that the, we've got, it says minus 4.4, .4, so that's telling us we're 4.4 millimetres left of the centre line, which means it's a 4.4 millimetre right-hand slew to get back to the centre. You can see the height, the target is zero, so we're sitting just around about the 18 to 20 millimetres, the orange line, and it, it's obviously the straighter the orange line, the better the track quality, so because the scale is so close there, um, it does look like a kind of rough line, but that is obviously millimetres a difference. The target, you'll see here the green zone, 
uh, run about the slough and the cant. So the bigger the green box, the more accurate you are to zero. And then you'll see the middle middle section there because we're about 20 millimetres, the green box is slightly less. So I'm going to put the video back to the start with it stopping it. And this is as quick as we get the data from shooting the point for the last 80 metres that we had surveyed. And once we hit the, the store button there, we get the option now to end the survey, start with a new reference point. In this case, we just hit continue the next chord. You don't need to shoot the point you just shot. You just start pushing the trolley forward again and you shoot your next point. So that's how it works out in the field. Once we've uh, collected the data on site, before we go out, we can create geometry files. So everybody knows a geometry file can be about a headache reading designs, manual tightening, radiuses, is it a minus radius, a positive radius, did you get the, the can't right, did you point the, the the arrow to the right leg to make it a high leg, a low leg, and all that kind of good stuff. So Guido Office, uh, the clever guys again, have made up a function. So in the Guido Office project, um, you import again the XML file for the designer, so it's the same XML file that's used in your creating your tamp files, the same one that's used in your bottom bars files and your dozer, so the raw data stays the same. As you can see, as you import the data, you can see here that you get your horizontal alignment, your cant alignment and your vertical alignment and all your changes. Some are kind of layout to WinALC, and I said it's a direct import from the designer, so there's no manual tighten up which avoids human error. So this uh, next wee video I'm going to play here, and you'll be lucky this one doesn't make you tilt your head, um, is real time. And this was a 3400 yard uh, geometry file that I created uh, the other night uh, for a job in the West Highlands, which is reverses, cants, and all that kind of good stuff that would take you um, a while to sit and work out. So this is real time, important, uh, the, the the raw data and then export it to a geometry file. So you can see there the three elements. They are horizontal, vertical and the can't. So you select them all and you import them. And it gives you a list, a list here of all the stuff, and there's the sum up to the screenshot on the left hand side. So if I was to pause that there, which is a lot of data, um, it shows you the reverse curves, the can, and, the, and all the vertical, the vertical information. And here, if I pause it again, this is all the exports you can get. So you can have one LC, Matisa, um, and that's sort of kind of tampers that we use in the UK. Pick one LC. So just like that, um, that is you know, the jobs, 3,400 yards plus a tap and overlap. So you're not too far away from 4,000 yards of geometry um, created in a minute, one minute, 10 seconds, if video was lasting. So one minute creates nearly 4,000 yards of geometry again, which is scary good. And the accuracy, there's no manual tap, there's no manual error. Everything's done exactly as per the design. So the raw data stays the same for every part of the process. So when we're on site, 
Um, after we've completed the survey, we watched the videos was pushing the trolley through. The date again, um, I've done in real time, I'll stop it and then I can play it from the start. This is how we export the files or input the, the data from the survey and then export that data from the survey into the tamper. So if I hit the play button, so import the measurement. A lock one at draw for the weekend passed. We see the tap run number two. We import. So we create a new tap node. The measurement is then dragged from the measurements part into the tamping. It's just a drag and drop. And then it's computing all the data. And then if I just pause this here, you can see here that you've got your change every five meters. You have your horizontal shift, your uplift. So that's your, your lift uh, towards zero is the target. So again, you're up to between seven mil there, up to 20 mil shy of design, and then your can error. So your can is only out where again, almost three millimeters. Uh, and that's us getting ready for our, for our second tamp. So I'll continue to play the video. So that's is the, the the numbers. We can show the numbers on the page again. We've got a graphic view. So again, the white lines up the middle are the center line to zero. Zero is a target. So as you can see, the line and again is millimeters either side of the zero line, and the lift is quite smooth. Um, top, sorry, is quite smooth below zero. So that's in the measurement mode. As we go into the tamp mode now, you can see is this is where we're going to start creating the files. So the white line in the centre is zero. So you try and slow everything to zero. The the left and the middle section zero is obviously the finished target. So you try and aim just below zero for your construction as you're building up. And obviously you can't and the right far right hand side, as you're seeing, you let the can error in the bottom right hand side is 1.1 millimeters. So this is us going to create the files. So from here to the end is how quick you can take data from site, create an offset file and export it. So that there, that five, six seconds, uh, four clicks of the mouse has just gave us um, an offset for the horizontal position for a thousand meters of track. And now we'll do the, the, the lift. And that was aiming there to leave it four millimeters shy of design. So that there is a thousand meters of track surveyed. And as you see in the bottom right hand corner here, what I was trying to do was if you're looking at the can, find that you've got a can in red. But I was trying to fix that there. But if you look at the can error, it's only 0 0.3 millimeters. So you're not going to try and left at one millimeter to fix 0 0.3 millimeters. But you see the red is an error because how accurate the system measures to. So 0 0.3 millimeters I can error. So right click 
export and it's DOS, the tampers don't like the other one, we use the DOS version. Let's save. This is a bit here now, we get the chance to, to pick everything else. So I only use the interpolate grid part of this because the working direction we change manually in the tamper, reversing, and the part underneath using the max and min uh, values again, we use the tamper to, to set them. So in this case, we're going to interpolate the grid and I'm going to export it out at five meter intervals. Export succeeded. And if I go back to the desktop, there's a different offset file and it opens up in one ALC. So as I just put that straight in the USB stick and plug it straight in the tamper, there you go, a thousand meters of offset made up in a minute. So I'll put it back to the start without me starting and stopping. Then um, we can see the, the, the process of importing the data and exporting into the tamper. And the video lasts about three minutes. So three minutes to take, obviously I've been using it a wee while, but three minutes to take a thousand meters of data and export it back in a tamper. So if you're tamping a thousand meters, and this is your second run, the time you're on the tamper and the tamper um, gets the cell back to the start position, you then have the data ready to go. So again, it saves time. And that's us got to the end, a couple of minutes, the data's created and then exported into five minute intervals which helps obviously with our track quality. And you can export that down even less but where we find five metres what's best. The tamper operators, uh, they like it when they see uh, a 3.9 millimetre slew, so now we work to point in mills with our, uh, our tamp schemes. So that there is how we create the data. We then go on and we, do, we can do speed raising reports. So this is us continuing on. So the measurement from the, the tamped data um, can be imported. So we take the, the tamp data, the measurement, we drop this in, fix changes, we're going to do 10 metres, 10 metre steps, and this, this helps us fill out our commissioning paperwork. And as you see there, if I was to pause this here, we imported it in, 
and it tells us the line speed that the even though we've got a line speed of in this case 90 miles an hour but it's seen as is the the slow change and the lift change and the can't change is fit for all these speeds um, if obviously the track the track was allowed to be there so but it says as here as well the green boxes tells me my lift change 3.4 mil can't change so i can easily identify where the biggest lift change is where the biggest can't change is where the biggest slow change and that's the details that goes into the commissioning document for the form a um, also gives us a twist report which you can see in one of the columns so I'll go back to this rather than exporting 10 metre intervals, I'll go back and I export it's half a metre intervals, and that's the evidence uh, for our twist report for pre tamp, post tamp, before we put any trains or stuff over it. So we scroll down, it tells us our worst gauge, which also um, goes into the form G. In this case, here it's saying uh, one of the parts there because of the, the the gauge is 14.40. This new track, there's a good chance it can have been a bit of dirt or some of that. It's in um, 65 to 95, which again was still in tolerance for our 90 miles on our opening speed. Our worst cat change is 3.7 mil, which is also telling us we're still within tolerance of the 90 miles on our opening speed. And that's that video finished. So this is a, a screenshot of the speed, uh, just a speed raise um, that we just viewed there. So you can see the tabs at the top. So it's telling you the slew absolute. Uh, that's telling you that for design. The slew change, so that's a step between the slew, the slews on the left-hand side. Then you've got the lift absolute, so we have 17 and 15 millimetres and stuff for us before we go back and do our second run. And then we have the lift change. You have your uh, delta cant, which is your differentiation for the design cant. You have your twist value and you have your gauge value. So all these things can be done at the end of the shift, which aids the help of um, filling our commissioning documents and viewing all the data. Um, versus looking at a bit of paper that we had been writing in in the, the pissing rain for the last eight hours. So it helps the visual inspect the visuals and the colours, uh, pick out the worst parts for you so you can fill out your paperwork. And that's me got to the end of a presentation that's kind of detail, but not hourly detail, which you could go through. There's so many functions. Um, and this software that um, you could spend days and days and days looking at uh, the exports or the, and all the tricks you can do or the surveying methods and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm happy to um, answer any questions if anybody's got, uh, if anybody's without sending like a sales rep again, but uh, I'll answer as much as I can uh, for the experience that I've got by, by using uh, the kit. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. That was absolutely fascinating. And, and from my perspective, having been that soldier, but without these tools, I can just see how much uh, how much labour savings involved. No more dodging around the tamper, trying to get ahead with the, the markup on the head of the rail, so as the tamper tower operator can look down and read the number, lift and slew, and then check behind the machine what's actually being achieved by the machine. All of this done electronic, absolutely fantastic. I've got some questions, and while I'm asking my questions, if anybody else has any questions on Paul's presentation, please open the questions box and, and type them in there, and I'll take them one by one. But in the meantime, if I can just um, uh, take some of the questions, not necessarily in any particular order, just my first question is about accuracy and precision. Uh, does the ability to see that precision in sub-millimeter value detract from uh, what it really means in numbers? So when you see 1.6 millimeters versus 0 0.9 millimeters, does it really, d d d how do you react to that? Is it not just one or one and a bit? Yes. 
we treat it as one, one in a bit. Um, as I said, when we're building the file um, for the tamping, we find that when we're applying lift uh, to get to zero uh, or get to a target, say we're aiming for minus 10, for 10 low, um, what will happen is, is the cant value will go red and then for a while we were trying to lift the track more uh, with a couple of millimetres to sort it and stuff like that. But then when we're hovering over the can error issue, the can't only out with 1.2 millimetres or four or 0 0.4 millimetres. So the actual effort trying to apply one millimetre to fix another millimetre, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a bit much um, for the point of millimetres, but it gives us a laugh when we're on site. This, <laughs> this thing's measuring to 0.4 mils. So that, that's, that's, that's the words that we the, use. The tamper operator saying, you know, I love it, slews a 3.9 millimetre. It means there's got very little to do in the machine. That yeah. was me. That was me putting it nicely when they seen the point of millimeters. <laughs> There's a lot of shoes. I, I know. I, I know these machine operators. <laughs> but but it, it just I, I looked at it and I had that smile and I have the same thing from the design perspective. So my young graduates and they want to sub millimeter accuracy. You know, six decimal places of a millimeter. That's great. I know Bentley can do that. But let's just have it in real numbers, please. It's like. You know, change. Can we have change to the nearest meter, please? You know, that all that kind of thing. Have it realistic. They they can be understood by the humans on the ground. Uh, a question about the the gauge measurement that was giving you a little, perhaps not a, a moment in your speed raising, but you know, it flags up a, a yellow cell because you know it's sixty to ninety five, rather than the one twenty five uh, opening speed. Gauge measurement is that a dynamic gauge measurement, and that could that be caused by um, the the fastenings or the the insulators or the, the shear screws or something there? Is there something in that dynamic measurement, if it is dynamic, that you can understand and relate that to certain sections of the track? Yes. So I mean, one of the biggest the biggest things we get is is because when you build up. Uh, the model from the start at actually your reference gauge. So in this case, it's 1438. So, but it doesn't allow for us. So obviously we do the um, have transition rules because we put on to send 56 from our previous renewal or we're upgrading from old, old 113 or whatever. So when we push the first section and the tamp overlap, it automatically can start coming up these. Um, errors of gauge because the gauge itself isn't as per the model that you've built, but it doesn't give you an option to go between 38, 35 or or anything like that. So again, we get it in S and C a lot where where our uh, Sense 60 stuff, because some of the new Mark II Sense 60 stuff is get bigger gauge readings through the switches, so stuff like that you need to know the data that you're looking at, so you don't just look at that speed raising report and automatically dismiss it as an error, because some of the track is meant to be different, but you can't differentiate different gauges at different points, so only actually for a base gauge, predominantly base gauge. Okay, it was just a, you know, measure dynamically as opposed to, so you you see this gauge measure coming up in the machine, if it's a dynamic measurement, you go and check it with a can stick behind the machine, you're measuring a static number, and you think, "Where's that coming from?" And you yes, but I mean, the box. machine, the machine itself, um, there's no weight to it, so that that wouldn't put, apply any forces to get any different gauge what you get for a can stick. That's what I was trying to get. I was just trying to see if there was a preload yeah. on on no. the on the measurement wheels. There is, there is, there is a handle, but it's not enough to force anything across right. inside. Um, some new house, new new clips or fastenings. Okay, that, that, that's answered the question. Some questions from the audience now. Uh, what, first one in from Stuart Corey. He, he says, you said that showing slews and lifts every five metres gave you best performance. Do you know why that is? Well, what, what we found is, is um, if you were taking 10 metre cords and in between that 10 metre cord, you had a belly in the rail, which wasn't in the 10 metre, and your 10 metre interval, then you were relying on the geometry to sort that 10 metre belly. 
Um, but now you've broken into five metre sections, you're picking up more data. Um, so the more data that you've got, the more reference points you're giving to the tamper. So the tamper's got more, because it's, it's seen more data, then if, uh, if yeah, it's just like data going from, more, from half chords to quarter chords, you're getting more control of what exactly you're, what, what, what's, your, what's happening with your track geometry. That's okay. exactly that, because uh, you know yourself with checking 10 metre chords, there could be a high spot or a, a, a belly in the rail and between your 10 metre chord, the only way you see that is by either interpolating the two chords in between and measuring or by visual. So in this case, um, it show, when you see it in the, the data version, it, that's showing you every single metre along the track, so you can see any spike anywhere you like. But when we export it to the tamper, we found the five metre chords gives the tamper more information, which then gives, gives better accuracy. Exactly. So, a uh, question from Manny Jukan Athan now. He says, "Hello, Paul. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I've encountered difficulties in my teaser tamper reading design tamper files with zero mil can. Have you had an experience with that in your career? We don't use my teaser tampers in Scotland. I'm afraid. That's what I thought. And he was the second part of that was, if so, could you please advise how it could be resolved? Yeah. But uh, sorry, Manny, it's uh, not something we come across. It's plaza and tower and machines all the way, I think. Uh, next question from Joe Johnson. Can the 3D laser control work with excavator dozers? Be, sorry. Can the 3D laser control works with excavator dozers be carried out in tunnels, or is it dependent on satellite GPS? No, tunnels, tunnels is fine. So when, we, when we're working in tunnels or areas of tree coverage or embankments or uh, inside cuttings and stuff like that where GPS doesn't work, we use the UTS version, which is the total station and the glass prism. So the dozer we use, generally we use 75% uh, UTS, which is total station. Uh, we use that mainly in plain line as well because plain line goes through all sorts of cuttings, environments and stuff like that, whereas S and C generally is wider open because it branches off maybe into two, three, four, five lines, so we get more uh, sky coverage, but majority of the time it is UTS and that can be used uh, tunnels and stuff like that, yeah. Sorry, um, my my mistake for, for muting myself. Uh, let me try again. So this one is from Stuart Colvin. He says, hi, Paul, great insight into the general generational change of survey and implementation of designs. A lot of us on the call have been through the labor intensive old school methods, but it gave us a very detailed understanding of the theory behind what we were doing. So that basic understanding because we're doing the old school. Is there a risk that we might lose core theory and understanding uh, as the new generation become reliant in the ease of using this new technology? How do we Absolutely. ensure that, that the technicians really understand what they're doing and not just going through the motions of... Uh, I reckon it's the difference between being a chef and being a cook, cook following a recipe and a chef using the ingredients. Yes, absolutely, Stuart's right. Um, again, I learned uh, old school, as you like, as old school as it was going to be. Um, there still is some few old school people about. I mean, this technology 
is changing, but it's not changing that fast. There's still a lot of um, techniques going on and sites that isn't all this um, this technology, but we're we're getting to that stage. So what we found is is my apprentice who came across me from Amy Sersa. It's core skills learning with sheets of paper and numbers and pencils was a lot different from the guys working in plain line, just for the sheer fact that we were using all the technology and the guys at the plain line hadn't been doing it yet. So the way we done that is we then mixed up and we swapped apprentices around uh, to get them back out in the sites, um, learning the original way to do it. Um, but there will be an element eventually um, that some of them won't ever, ever see the way that we used to do it. So we'll ever have to go back. I don't know. Um, because a lot of guys now, as we spoke earlier, manual tamping, uh, even that, I've only done that um, a handful of times, and that's when it's been really, really done to the wire with stuff going wrong. Uh, some of the guys, the younger techs, have never even seen a dual grade laser. Exactly. Before. And, and I, was so, going to, I, was, I was going to mention that some of the issues you mentioned in your presentation about, you know, reinstating pegs that were destroyed or you know how to do that. The techniques that we used in the past to, to overcome that were, were taught, and they were there. And if, you know, think if you haven't been taught them, you think it can't be done. Uh, I used a dual grade no. laser with with great effect for many years. Um, yes, Moss End West. The last person that took out what Moss End West, as far as I know, before you did it, was me uh, and Stuart Douglas. The night that oh, Tony Stuart. McHugh lost the panel. <laughs> okay, so been there, have the T-shirt. So what you threw away and put in in concrete, I put in originally if it was timber. Um, it's just that, that kind of kind of thing. It's it's the questions about, I guess, as the generations skip over to make sure that the knowledge is captured and transferred, and that the fundamental engineering practices are retained, even what? though we've got lots of labour-saving devices. The fundamental engineering principles will be these eventually, and the way that we knew won't even yeah. exist. I guess so. Maybe I'm just mourning a passing. Uh, and on that note, Russell Kemper asks, well, you know, it's first of all, fantastic presentation, Paul. Thanks. Based on what you've shown, do you think that in the future, dozers and excavators will be fully remote without an actual operator? Oh, I don't. <laughs> Did the, you the the the, <laughs> <laughs> they probably have potential, you know, but again, safety implications um, and stuff like that. See, see, to be fair, they're not far off it um, now. But that that auto mode, you can get the auto mode in some of the the diggers. So what actually happens is, is he presses the auto button and it actually scrapes the formation to the level itself, rather than using the joystick. The only time you take out auto is to take the spoil and put it in the train. So that's when auto function on. The bugs now. The, the I had a question on the auto me. function for the dozer. If you'll let me ask that, the, the yeah. question was uh, dozers, in my view, right? The great tools, and you set them on auto. But when you have collected more material than the blade can handle, that starts to start to run off the end of the blade. Um, you then call upon the take two goes at it and that's a skill in the operator being able to sweep material to the side as well as control the level would you not yes. always need that ability to take it off auto to deal with the heat that you've collected in front of the blade yes yeah, so you can take it off auto you just press, it's just a case of pressing the button so if he's setting back so if he, he does his first push and he's setting back he just presses the button auto he lifts the blade runs back and as he starts to move forward again, he presses auto and it positions the blade again. But what you can do to keep it in auto to keep your shape, there's also another trigger in there. And if, say, you're saying you wanted to push it in uh, manual because you wanted to add on 100 mil uh, to try and get rid of some of the, the extra stone first if we grade it to finish, all you do is click the button 10 times and that puts it up 100 mil. Just 10 clicks of a button, that's up. I'm just going to forward. I just wonder if that buttoning up function that I've come across was still available there with that yeah. auto. We still need, yes. and there was, no, there was no substitute for a good 
uh, dozer operator, if you've got a good dozer operator and with the tools that's available now, you can more or less leave him to his own devices because he knows exactly what's required and he's got the control of the level that he needs. Yes, you're absolutely at the mercy of the dozer operator. A good you get to the stage that we used to get by a dozer operator. Yeah, and in, in days gone by, we used to specify specific people. We would say, you know, in fact, so if I'm going to Trin tonight, I want to make sure Paul's in the dozer, the guy I had last week, because he's an ace. Or same, I might not want Paul. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and that's where, you know, operators get a reputation about them. And you will you will quickly know as a tech what, what the ones to be trusted and the ones maybe not to be trusted. Uh, next question from, oh, first of all, Thanks, Graham Hutchison, for pointing out that zero measurement is static. Uh, from Richard Spears. Hello, Richard. Paul, very interesting presentation. Do you know how zero Office software was developed? I assume Network Rail have been involved that it holds limit values from the NR construction standard 2102. Also, yes. could you say something about the time intervals between survey and data, sorry, between survey and data use by time based machines on renewal follow-ups? So if you're doing a follow-up renewal, what kind of uh, time limit do you have between survey and, and actually using that data? So could you survey at the end of one weekend, say, and then use that survey to uh, go out the following weekend and do a follow-up time? Yes, it's just the same as before when you uh, you held the data on your sheet of paper, took it back to the office, created your scheme, typed it up and went back the next week. So every run that we do for uh, for that job if i was to go back if the, can you still see my screen yeah yep if i go back and go to this one here so this is just a job so you've always got your your pre tamp survey to see under the measurements the i think that, that was the number, the number of richard's question he was saying if you if you assumed that the track would settle in the midweek intervening between survey Saturday night one and TAMP, follow-up TAMP, survey, sur sorry, follow-up TAMP week two and the settlement happened, would you have to then survey again to add that settlement onto your lift values? Yes, you, you, you can. So uh, with the speed, you could go back out the day prior. Usually we, we would do a Thursday night uh, push uh, the trolley through for the latest data. Um, but the, the process is still the same as what it was before. I mean, if you're tamping and you've found it's lagged a couple of millimetres from during the week's passage, you, again, you just wind the, ta the, the lift on manually using the, the operator. You just ask me, I wind on an extra five mil. Yeah. I, I, I would just, you know, could you, would you have to go with the tamper? just to keep them right. So, you know, is there always, would you, with the speed of this thing, could you go out and do your measurement run just immediately prior to the tamping run? Y yes, yes. So one of the, the instances this happened before, um, it was a five week tamp. I was involved in, in uh, Lockerbie, 1000 metres, uh, Lockerbie South, and the tamper, with the possession went on at half past 10, the tamper had to come out of Lockerbie Sidings through the points and up to sites, which was going to take about 45, 50 minutes. And I surveyed the 1,000 metres and had the tamping information ready at the time the tamper came out of the sidings and up to the site. So because of the speed, you, uh, with no, no machines are empty in front of you, just a plain bit of railway, you, two techs, and the trolley, you'll survey 2,500 metres an hour. Excellent. So as quick as you can walk then. Pretty much, and I know Graham's listening here. I think they do the West Coast. They'll, they'll probably tell you the same. They'll be even quicker. We're using the the, the spigot functions. Um, it's plug and play. Click it on, shoot the target, and move on. So you, you can do a couple of thousand meters an hour. That's that's real productive. So yes, that's good. That's yes, good. good answer, so yes, yeah. you can do a survey just before the tamper comes. Okay, one from John Oates now. Uh, can Giro cope when bottom ballast is poor? And there's a need to overlift beyond the tamper limits or where there's insufficient top ballast to achieve your design. In other words, are you still limited by how much stone you've got in the ground? 
again, it's the same. The same. The same principles apply to you reading figures on a sheet of paper, looking at how much ballast you've got in the ground, and how much tamping or lift you think's achievable. Um, again, this this tamp here, lock one up, lock one up. We done at the weekend. Had the first tamp was done for the MFS wagons. Um, we had a, a bit of frozen ballast, so we never got out as much ballast as we hoped in the first pass. So we limited the lift to the we limited the lift. So if I go back to again one of the images. I can see. It's easier to explain when you can see. So in this function here, uh, the middle column is, is obviously for zero. So if you look at the ballast and say, well, I don't think I can get 20 mil out of this, you can then follow, the, see the yellow line? You can then follow that line and add 20 millimetres onto it. It's just the same as when you were scheming before using your sheet of paper with your figures. So you can follow the line that's there and just add 10, 15 millimetres on it so that you're taking some shape out in the, into, the, into the top. Um, and the same with the the same with the, the lining. Say you had, for instance, um, something went wrong, they fine lined it wrong and you had over 100 millimetres slews. You know you can only do 50, so you only need to apply 50 millimetres of the design slew. You don't need to go always aim for zero, so you can step it in and out just the same as you would do uh, creating a scheme using a sheet of paper in the figures. Okay, thank you. Um, Does that help? One, yeah, yeah. Um, one from Liam White now. What gauges, for example, Mephisto, have you found give the closest accurate UTS setup? And his secondary piece of information, we operate large numbers of sites each night on London Underground, achieving a small meterage. So a UTS on each site is not feasible. So are there so any gauges that give you a closer accuracy, give you closest accuracy to UTS? Accuracy as in what, what's this for? For what process? For tamping, dozing, digging? What, what process do you mean? I'm assuming it's tamping. A gauge? I'm not really sure what he means by a gauge. Okay, Liam, if you could expand on that, Liam. And if not, we'll take your question as a, a verbal question at the end. I move on to the, the last one uh, on the written questions from Phil Kitland. A fabulous presentation, first of all, he says. Does this approach drive any greater focus on machine maintenance? And frequency of machine calibration. Our kit uh, goes away for a yearly calibration, and by the manufacturer, but you self-calibrate it in uh, the start of each shift. So I think it's a tamper. tamper. Well, the tamper. The tamper. Yeah, so it's the machinery, so machine maintenance, so on-track machine maintenance, so uh, you know, making sure the machine. machine. Again, that's that's a different part of Babcock. So I'd imagine they just go through the same the same three monthly and six monthly routines. Uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I don't I don't know. Okay. I don't that's think that. so. That's fine. Uh, maybe we can have someone in the audience who can answer that question. And if not, um, thanks for that. Before we go to uh, the uh, the audio. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open the mics to all. And if you want to ask uh, a question, please um, say your name and ask your question. I'll take them one at a time. If, uh, let me see if I can have options. Attendees can raise hands. So if you could raise your hand if you have a, a verbal question to ask. And then hopefully you can unmute yourself and you can talk. That sounds like a definite science. Either I've done it wrong or nobody's want to say anything. 
So I had, a, I had a question, and this is this is a question I'm asking on behalf of William Burns. Hello, Willie. Uh, and the question is, the as-built survey, it seems to me, gives you no opportunity to massage the figures, in inverted commas, and uh, it always is a record of truth. In other words, you can't read uh, a six-foot value and then apply your own uh, uh, effects to it. I don't know how Wally wants me to answer this. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I, I don't know why I'm picking this up. I saw Wally's name on the, on the attendance list, and I just thought I would ask that question on his behalf. No, oh, there was any, right. no stage so three lying involved. Um, no, it is, it is what it is. Um, because your export, again, the only thing you could massage this is uh, if you export it out, you would need to go through a lot of um, messing around to change those of coordinates because they, when you do an export out for your assurance, the, the, um, the coordinates are also against your deltas. So if you were to change a horizontal position, you would also need to work out cleverly how to change a um, a coordinate to, to suit that position. Okay, uh, just a, a note, Thomas McCallum has said, I'm sure calibration on SB tampers, Shvatelsky Babcock tampers is carried out on a monthly basis as a minimum, but it's carried out additionally to that frequency if there are calibration reports come back from site where uh, issues have been noted. So that's one. Uh, answer from thanks for that, Thomas. Could somebody unmute themselves and just say hello, even just so right. I know that I've done it right? Hello, hello there, uh, Hi, Steve. I'm Paul. It's uh, Jim Watson here. I really just like to add to what Willie Burns was saying. I think a very, very important part of uh, the system is the creation of credible contemporary records. So we're actually getting an absolute position of where the track is. Not where we think we'd like it to be, but it's an absolute position. And that data is credible. You also, um, there's an export function that you export out digitally. So it's not your, your numbers, but it's actual um, a DXF file, which then is imported directly with designers and they can overlay it to the original design and they can tell the difference in the office rather than a page full of numbers. So there's a function to export out digital designs as well, digital surveys. It's not just uh, lifts and slews and numbers or graphs. You can actually get a digital output as well. Okay, thank you. That makes it foolproof. Uh, Wobbs gets hand up. Ollie, unmute yourself and say a few words. You need to unmute yourself, so there'll be a button somewhere that you can unmute and speak. I think that's me unmuting now, Tommy. That, that previous yeah. question was not from me. <laughs> uh, I work with Paul quite closely and know the ins and outs of this machine and uh, its capabilities and uh, what it can do and what it can bring to the party. Uh, I see this as a way forward. The old uh, Hallet handle stringing and adjusting pegs are no more. Uh, I think we need to move on. The precision involved in this is, is, is something uh, else, I think. It's absolute. Uh, like, this is definitely the new dawn uh, yeah. for, uh, in terms of the technical our technical capability yeah. out there in, in the wind and rain on the Saturday night is yeah. vastly improved. And our wee legs will not be run off us the way that they used to be because we have information at our fingertips to digitally load up to the machines instead of opening the tamper door and shouting, 10 on the tower and hold it up the hill. That's right. The big downfall of the machines is the cost. They're sucker 140, 150,000 pounds per machine. And that's a big, that's a big uh, outlay to, to any contractor. But it's just an investment because what you get Absolutely. from it, I think, is the, the quality and, as Jim noted, <laughs> the auditable trail of what you've left behind you should you ever need it come the day when somebody's poking around saying, how did you leave that track? You That's have right. 
you have left a, an electronic footprint of, of your diligence on the night, whereas That's before right. you only had your reputation to rely on. That's right. Any other yeah. questions from anybody that would like to unmute themselves? Okay. Right. Well, let, let's just move on then. I'll I'll steal back the the presentation uh, from you, uh, Paul, and I'll move us back to the agenda, which hopefully you can see now. And um, we've done the questions and comments. I would like now to ask John Oates to unmute himself and and propose the vote of thanks for the members, if you can, John. Not quite unmuted, John. Try again. Ah, that may be a problem then. Okay, um, Jim, would you like